So um, we're, we're going to start that May, May the 10th. Um, we put in 50, I'm testing my memory here, 50 uh, 450 watt panels on the football club with 48 kilowatt hours of battery. Yep, I'm right. <laughs> yep, okay. And uh, we'll interlink that with the generator. And we'll be putting two air conditioners in also the football club so that in the time of need that everyone needs to go somewhere, they'll have somewhere to go and they'll still have power and they'll still be comfortable. On the netball club, we're gonna put seven and a half kilowatts worth of end phase solar and a Tesla power wall so that when the CFA use that as a stage down area, they'll have somewhere to go. And that's part of the community project. I'm involved because I live in Glenburn. I only moved seven months ago. Um, no, probably eight months ago. I moved down from South Gippsland, uh, where Tom's from, um, and wanted to be a part of the community. So this is what I'm here. This is where I'm here. Thanks, Grant. Um, I'm not here to try and sell you solar today, just purely to be informative as much as we can. Walk through the different kinds, the rebates available. Um, battery storage, electric vehicle charging. If anyone has any questions at any stage, feel free to let me know and I can try and answer them the best I can. Um, so to start with, obviously panels is a fairly important choice. Understanding where they're manufactured, probably 90% of panels are manufactured in China, which is not an issue. Maybe 10 years ago it was a big problem, but they've increased in leaps and bounds and every panel in Australia has to par pass rigorous standards and it has to be made for the Australian environment. They can't sell it here. So the, so the, the longest Chinese ones, are they better? That was my next point. Yes, absolutely. There's plenty of Chinese products available in the market. They're probably your middle ground, but there's plenty of other products above and beyond that, like LG, SunPower, REC, that are manufactured across Singapore, North Korea, that have a longer warranty. You pay a little bit more for them, but they probably produce more power for longer difference in warranties being probably 15 versus 25 year warranty. So in regard to warranty, there's two warranties on panels. There's a product warranty and a performance warranty. Pretty much every panel in Australia has a performance warranty of 25 years, which means if the panel was to last 25 years, they'll honor that. They'll rate its performance basically versus the product warranty, which is if the panel actually fails, they'll replace it within that period of time. How long is that going to be? The warranty period. Yeah, as you said, it's a bit of growth here. Yep. And at what stage did that guarantee come in? The performance warranty. It's probably just something that's happened in the last four years yeah. that they've all started selling a performance warranty as a sales tool. Whether the product warranty is ten years or twenty five years, as soon as someone hears twenty five year warranty, it sounds a lot better than yeah. the product warranty. So it's confusing I suppose as far as I'm concerned the performance warranty doesn't mean much it'd be pretty hard pressed in 25 years to prove that your panels didn't perform as well as they were supposed to versus the product warranty that will tell you otherwise um, two main kinds of inverters we've got a standard string inverter which is obviously a series of panels in a row all connected so if we have a shaded house for example if one panel is shaded that whole string is then shaded and that's what leads us to potentially look at microinverters, which is effectively an inverter under each panel. So they all perform independently. Microinverters are probably 10 to 15% more expensive than a string inverter, and they also have panel level monitoring, so you have a little bit more visibility, but for most roofs, a standard string inverter will work just as well. Does it cost much to convert from going from one to the other? What's that, sorry? If you've got a string inverter at the moment, yes. it would cost a lot to change it. You would have to replace the whole system. It's yeah. not just something that you no. you retrofit necessarily. Oh yeah. yeah. So the standard string inverter. Well, no. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the standard string inverter is obviously the inverter on the wall with, oh, with some the, cables coming down. I'll cut the tree. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a cheaper solution. But you can put um. There are DC string um, optimizers. Optimizers. Yeah. Which will simulate the same same role. So you can't actually singly deploy or multiply de deploy them on strings where there is shading and you can retrofit them. Okay. Yeah. So no yeah. Probably eighty dollars ish a panel. Oh. Yeah. So not particularly expensive. Can we get a copy of this? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Of More than happy to do that, yeah. Sure. Well, yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can do that. We could put it on our website. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well yeah, that's 
Yeah, sure. Think, we'll pass yeah. it through. Yeah, mm -hmm. most definitely. Um, the third component is monitoring platform. That's probably something that's relatively new in the solar space that not a lot of people currently have. And I've got an image of what that might look like here. So effectively, there's production monitoring and um, consumption monitoring. So production is obviously what happens on the inverter. So that's basically what this curve represents. This is just a day in January this year. You can see as the sun rises, this is an all north facing array. And then this blue line represents consumption monitoring. So the reason that this is valuable is you can see how and when your power is being consumed. And obviously if we try and consume as much power inside that production curve, we're gonna save more money um, effectively, unless you're on a 66 cents feed in tariff, which I think someone in here was, which obviously that's the complete opposite, where you don't wanna use any of that power because you generate revenue from doing that, but obviously that's completely changed now. Um, so yeah, self-consumption is probably the, the key to trying to save money, um, which is trying to run your appliances during daylight hours, which this app then allows you to have that visibility when that's happening. So dishwasher, washing machine, split system, if you have one, preferentially where possible run during the day. Obviously it's not possible to always cook dinner at lunchtime or anything drastic, but the more that you can proactively change that, the more money you will save. The feed-in tariff, there's been a fair bit of talk in the market at the moment about potentially charging people to export power, mm -hmm. which isn't something that's gonna to happen today or tomorrow or even next year. It's probably like a 10 year plan, but what it is is more, charging people for feeding back into the grid is only one part of the story. Is the biggest, cheeky? pardon? Is it cheeky? It is cheeky, but there's a reason for it. So the long-term plan is to have a smart grid where everyone's solar and battery plays a part in normalizing demand when if you have a lot of power being produced on your roof and the local area requires that power they might pay you handsomely for that export back to the grid to support the network vice versa if everyone isn't home and there's lots of solar being produced they don't want you to send any power back to the grid so all of the inverters that we're installing today have the capability further down the line to be able to dynamically control that export so it will sell power at times of profit but also round down your production so you don't export any power to save money. So it's a part of a bigger picture. They're talking about in South Australia turning off people's solar. Yes. Does that mean they're turning off their ability to export or their ability to produce? Export is the preference. However, some of the older inverters that aren't capable of export control, they're just simply turning them off. When they are turning them off, it might happen four times a year. Yeah. It's very minimal, and it's purely to ease the strain on the grid. Effectively, there's a base load that always has to be produced from the power station, and solar is this messy sort of jump that up the top that has a lot of peaks and troughs because of the, sh the clouds coming over effectively. And when there's too much power being produced, they can't just ramp down a 100-ton generator. They have to be able to take that top off and solve that first thing that they do. How do I switch off the solar? They can do it remotely through this smart meter. Um, Not currently in Victoria, it is something that they're moving towards. They can do it in South Australia currently, they can disrupt the frequency and it turns inverters in a localised area off if they don't have that smart functionality. Yeah, love to. So the feeding tariff, currently now the minimum set at 10.2 cents, you may be able to get a higher feeding tariff from another retailer. As of July the 1st, the decision's already been made, that feeding tariff's dropping to 6.7 cents per kilowatt hour. Seriously? Yes. When's the feeding tariff ending? That ends in November 2024. Oh, yeah. So there's actually no point really having solar. Solar? No, solar. Oh, the feeding tariff. <laughs> the feeding tariff. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, excess solar is causing more issues to the grid than helping it. It's not like it is sending free power to the grid that they can use, it's causing more issues. So that feed-in tariff will probably continue to drop off to nothing eventually, but it's starting to turn the argument around on, do we start to look at a battery to make sure that we're independent from that grid? Because then we can store that excess power, we're not losing it, and then we're saving that 30 cents we would have otherwise wasted effectively. So that's just part of the process. <coughs> so there's no real, in longer term, there's no real need to, to have it linked to the, to the grid. 
you, you still need to have the grid as a backup, per se. Especially in rain. To become yeah. independent from the grid, you need to have three days of battery storage redundancy and probably a backup generator as well. So yeah, if everyone wanted to go off grid, that'd be great. But realistically, you're looking at thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars in battery storage to be able to achieve okay. hundred percent independence. So I'm with a, a retailer who tells me I've never really checked it out that yep. they that they only export to the grid. They follow a spot price. Yep. And spot price is up. They take it out of my battery and export it to the grid. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Have you got a reposit? A what? A reposit? No. Mm -hmm. no. I had one removed with surgery, it was very painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a system that allows you to do that control, they, that's how they control them. That is the early stages of this smart grid control and it's probably called, eventually it's going to be called a virtual power plant. Mm. Where when the spot price of electricity could be $14,000 per megawatt hour, they might pay you a, a $14 feed-in tariff for that power that you're producing. And when it drops into a negative, when they don't want your power, it won't export power to the grid. So that's an early form of that, basically. Yeah, that's what they're trying to work on. Avoid, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's trying to maximise the benefit for you. Yeah, what's who's your energy retail? Mendes Energy. Never heard of it, to be honest. Yeah, oh, they've got another name. Um, Diamond. No. Uh, Dodgy Joe's Services. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, seriously. Uh, Mem <coughs> Mendes Energy. It's just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Evergen. Evergen. I'll have to do some research when I get home by the sound of it. Um, there's a few key points that I would recommend when looking for a solar company. Um, number one, a brand you can trust. So if someone you know has installed solar and had a good experience, it's probably worthwhile seeing what they have to say. Um, ideally, someone that employs local people. Supporting the community, it seems like there's a pretty good sense of community in Yay, and I think that speaks true to most of your values. Um, the CEC, or the Clean Energy Council of Australia, they're the governing body that sets all of the rules and the code of conduct for retailers in Australia and Victoria. And ideally, you want to see that top sticker, basically, that they are an approved solar retailer, so that they partake in that program. You can also go to the Clean Energy Council website and search for any retailer. They've got a list of everyone in Australia if you are unsure whether they're doing the right thing or not, basically. Um, as well as accredited installers, which Grant White is one of. Um, so they have to undergo a fairly rigorous training course, I suppose, and they've got to pass the test that they have the knowledge and the skills to be able to install a system to code and regulation. And there's a couple of requirements that must be shown on the quote in order to comply with these rules. The biggest one being the expected generation and an estimated savings, as well as the warranty terms, conditions, and an itemised list of all the products. If that's missing from the quote, then they're likely not part of this program, or there's something missing, more than likely. Um, probably also worth looking at online reviews. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, but as a whole, you'll see a lot of people have a good experience, or a lot of people have a bad experience, based on those reviews. In terms of the rebates that are currently available now, the first one is the federal government rebate, which is STCs. So that's based on the number of panels that you have. The more panels you have, the larger that rebate is. It's basically a carbon offset. Whatever your panels are gonna produce over the 15 years, they give you a credit for that when you install the system. The Solar Victoria rebate, which is currently $1,850, continues to drop every year until the year 2030. So it was 2,225, then became 1,888, that's now 1,850. As of June 30, that's going to drop again. By how much? Not sure. There's also an optional interest-free loan that you can choose to take on as well, which is to that same value, the 1,850. It's purely an interest-free loan through the state government that you pay back interest-free over four years. It's just up the up, up, off the upfront cost. There's three eligibility requirements in order to get this rebate. Number one is you don't have any existing solar on the property that wasn't installed post November 2009. Have to be the principal place of residence, so you have to live there. Um, the property has to be worth less than $3 million, and the combined taxable income of the household must be less than $180,000 per year. One other than that, you have to be connected to the grid. You do have to be connected to the grid, yes. Mm -hmm. So did, when it uh, got the, <coughs> the value, yep. the, uh, the $3 million, yep. is that a house, a house? Property. So 
sorry, the property according to the rates notice or the capital improved value must be less than three million. Farm, is that just five acres? Whatever it no, says on yeah, the rates notice. Yeah. I mean, that, so that'll abate, uh, a lot of farmers will be ineligible. Correct. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, Solar Victoria is one of those government-run uh, businesses that did consult us in regards to what the requirement should be and then didn't listen to anything we said, basically. So they make the rules, and if you don't fall into that category, you're ineligible for a rebate. What, is, what is if you're a landlord? landlord? Pardon? What if you're a landlord? Sorry, that's a good point. There is a landlord rebate available, and right. it will be based on the income of your tenants. Correct. Okay. Yep. But the federal one isn't dependent on the Correct. Rebate. Sorry. Federal rebate, everybody gets that rebate. It's, we include it in every quote that you see. That's an itemised line. Uh, and there's currently a Solar Victoria battery rebate available at the moment, which is $4,174. So it's quite a bit more significant than the other rebates currently available. The requirements are exactly the same in terms of property value and income, but you have to have at least five kilowatts of panels on your roof to qualify for this battery rebate. And you can't have both. You cannot have both, that is correct. You either get the Solar Victoria rebate or the battery rebate. If you've claimed the Solar Victoria rebate before, that makes you ineligible for the battery rebate, unfortunately. Can you add a battery if you've got an existing system? Huh? Yes, you can, provided that it's more than five kilowatts in panel capacity. What's the standard battery that you use at the I mean, it's how long is a piece of string question, really, but. Average household probably yeah, install a Tesla Powerwall, which would be 13.5 kilowatt hours of storage, probably 15 to 16 thousand dollars installed. So take your four thousand dollars off that, 10 to 12 ish. Yeah, that's about what you can use. Yeah. What if you've moved out? So you've got you've had the solar rebate yep. before, and then you go to a house which has got solar. Provided solar, it's provided. your principal place of residence and the address on your license matches the rates notice, you'll be eligible for that rebate. Landlord rebate, they can claim it up to two houses per year as well as their own house if they want to. So you can get three rebates if you're a landlord for a couple of other houses as well. Um, a battery can provide you with not just increased cost savings, but obviously increased dust consumption, load shifting, which means if there is any excess produced during the day in that curve, we can obviously take that chunk of power and consume it overnight. It also provides us with backup power as well. So if the grid goes down or you're in a remote area, it can provide you with ongoing power. It can also mimic the grid so that if you have a solar system, it can continue to run alongside effectively off grid until that battery is depleted or the grid comes back on and then it returns to its normal self. It can also monitor the solar as well as the battery. So if your current system doesn't currently have any monitoring and you decide to put on a battery, it will include monitoring provided there's Wi-Fi available to connect that connection. Can you go through the DC versus the home? So sure. Yep. People understand export limit. Yeah. How, how far off is um, self-sufficiency for individual homes? It depends how much money people are willing to pay, yeah. <laughs> really. Funding is going to be the, the thing that holds that back. So it's, a, it's realistic now if you've got the money to set Absolutely it up? Absolutely it is, yeah, most definitely. Mm. Um, there's a couple of constraints in regards to network. Because we live in the Osnat region, if it's a single phase, we can only put maximum 10 kilowatts inverter capacity on mm. per phase. So if we have a 5 kilowatt inverter already with 6.6 .6 kilowatts of panels, we can add a Tesla Powerwall which has 5 kilowatts inverter capacity inside it. That would be the maximum amount. If you have an eight kilowatt inverter on a single phase, you're unable to add any battery storage with the rules that are currently in place. So how's that going to work at the rep? It's DC coupled batteries, so they're behind the inverter. Correct. So, so there's 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 two different kinds of batteries. One, like the Tesla Powerwall, is what I call a smart battery, which effectively has the battery and the inverter built into one, and that converts DC to AC, so it's usable in the home. That inverter has capacity, you just can't add solar to the Tesla Powerwall. It has to be alongside another inverter that converts the DC on the roof to AC. The alternative to that is a hybrid inverter, which does two roles. It converts the DC power from the panels on the roof to usable power, 
It also charges the battery directly via DC current, which is like your dumb battery in your car. So if we use that sort of battery, we can have 10 kilowatts inverter capacity, as much battery storage as we like, and it can go back and forward with quite power to your home. Does that make sense? Yep, getting a few nods, a few maybe nods. <laughs> so, I think it's so, a DC rated as well. Yep. So, I was net class a Tesla and a, and a five kilowatt inverter as 10 kilowatts. So two inverters, but if you do a DC coupled battery, which comes off the, the inverter, you're allowed 10 kilowatts of solar inverter and as much battery as you like, because that's already been controlled by that inverter shooting the power out. It can't go anywhere. But they, they believe that at some stage, Tesla will release uh, an update, which will allow that, that battery to export and they'll lose total control of it. Does that make sense? So it's all about controlling the grid and Osnet being able to control what goes in and out to keep the grid stable. Does that help at all? Not really. <laughs> Maybe. Probably confused you more. Well, it gets down to the basics of what battery design it is. Yes. Yes. So there's a whole different, whole yes. another question. Correct. So I'll, I'll have you to just listen for the moment. Sure. <laughs> buying everybody's solar in Victoria, why don't they put in a decent battery pack in the line system, yep. so when we're producing power, it goes into that battery yep. to sell later at night? It's, it's effectively what they've uh, done in South Australia. Like yeah. They've put a big battery in place, the government put the bill basically, and then obviously everyone that pays power will also pay some part of that. Instead of wasting, like, you know, instead of wasting the yep. solar power, it's yeah. already paid for on the roof. Absolutely. The biggest, the biggest challenge is the electrical infrastructure that's already in place that's 30 or 40 years old. Correct, and it's not centralised. Like you've got farmers down a swirl line, there might be 20 people on that line. They can't physically send all that power back or the transformer will blow up. So the physical infrastructure limits that. Obviously in more populated areas, that is a reality, but it just, the cost is astronomical on that scale. It just goes up and up and up and up. It, it probably is a reality in the next couple of years. Um, but who knows when that will happen. I think the government really has to put the bill for that one, for that, yeah, yeah. For that to happen. Um, part of the future, electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging. There's an example that we sell. There's obviously a myriad of different options. You could put yours next to Tesla's out the back of your supermarket. We could, <laughs> absolutely we could. Um, so there's some smart controls that we can put with a, a, um, an electric vehicle charger so we can set it to only charge from excess solar if that's what we want, we want because it's going to make your power bill increase drastically. To give everyone some context, a Tesla Model S has a 100 kilowatt hour battery, the, um, the top of the line model that drives five or 600 kilometers. If you drain that to zero, it's going to take 100 kilowatt hours of energy to charge that car. So to put that in context, that's probably a 30 kilowatt solar system, which most of us can't fit on our roof, just to show you how much power is actually inside that. So solar is always going to be a supplement to an electric vehicle. The reason that people are moving to electric vehicles is obviously if you have an off-peak rate and you charge your car overnight at say 20 cents per kilowatt hour, it's only $20 to charge that car versus 80 or $100 for fuel. So although your power bill will be a couple of thousand dollars a month, you probably spend a lot, sorry, not a month, a quarter. A quarter if you had a Tesla, it's going to be far cheaper than if you're running it with petrol servicing tires. So I didn't realise it, but with the apparently um, cause hub with the problem, that, that with the Tesla battery, you can only drive te you charge Tesla cars. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about yours? Any car. Any. It's just about the cable that goes between the two, basically. So if you have a Nissan Leaf or a whatever the, any of the other brands are, provided you have the right cable, you can plug it in. And you can get an adapter for Tesla chargers. Yes, yeah, carry one around yeah. with you. Yeah. So, so the future will be that you're driving around your battery storage. Yeah. So what the future will be, it hasn't been released yet, but it will come very soon that you'll drive home and plug your battery in your house and your house is run by your car while charging. So yeah. that, that, that's the future. That's what we're looking at and that's why they're going that they're going to have that reverse charge. So you drive around, you go do all your chores, you do whatever you need to do, you charge it on solar wherever you plug, come home, you plugged your battery in, you've got a, your car's basically running the house. Thanks, Tom.
Okay. Yep. As a complete Correct. Yeah, you've yep. effectively got a battery on wheels because it's more than the capacity of any battery you'd likely install in your car. So, um, if that's the case, you don't actually need a battery for your house. No, no, that, they, you won't. Because that will be a car. Eventually. But you're going to have to buy. That, there's a the, there's a payoff between them both. Yeah, it depends on where you live, it depends on your road, it depends on all this. If you're in a remote area and you're going to... they come in new variety? No, I'm not yet. No having an electric car in like a few years. Well, they're bringing... There's a Tesla pickup coming later in this year. Oh, I've never... Yeah. Rivian. Yes, correct. There is. And it looks like a Ute. It does. Space age tank. Two. There's, I've read a lot of reports about um, new new uh, batteries that are based on things other than lithium, but sure. the only ones you ever see are lithium. Correct. Market. Yeah, so they just haven't reached market saturation, whether affordable or on a commercial scale that we can buy. Yes? Supercat batteries, yep. have, where are they up to? I looked at them two years ago and then the guy sort of said, well, wait another 12 months and pull the software sorted. Yeah, again, they exist, but not on a commercial scale that we can all buy. So going back to the problem that everyone's getting solar and it's buggering up the grid. Yep. If you're if this idea comes out, mm -hmm. that means it would stabilise the grid because absolutely. it's actually yeah. going it to your car. Like it solves both problems. Problem. Yeah, absolutely. You have security for your electricity so supply, but so also so they don't need to charge it to actually supply an electricity <clears throat> to the grid. Correct. Right. That's how the battery South Australia has made heaps of money. Exactly. Like grid stabilisation. Yep. yep. Instead of spinning up a big 100 ton generator, if there's a little bit that they can't produce, that battery just discharges instantly and covers that peak. Because it's all instantaneous. It's not like we know we're going to need power in an hour. Yeah. It's, we need it now. Yeah. Obviously, this whole scenario probably isn't super relevant for regional Victoria for quite some time, just purely for the fact that we drive a few hundred kilometres at a time and we're going to deplete our battery. In the city, it probably makes a lot more sense where you drive your car to work, plug it in, it has a big solar system on the roof, and then you come home and that powers your house. That makes a lot more sense. One of the biggest arguments I've seen is people saying, I can go to a petrol station, it only takes me five minutes to put petrol in my car. Correct. If I'm going into the country, how long is it going to take me to charge my car? Absolutely. Every time I stop? So it's something that they're continually improving. They've got some superchargers that'll charge 80% in 20 minutes. Again, it's still quite longer, quite a lot bit longer. Um, there's a company in America that is, instead of charging batteries, they're purely changing out the pack underneath. So they've got a big mm. bank of batteries you drive over, drop one out, puts another one in, away you go. Mm. So that'll be comparable, but obviously the infrastructure to be able to put that in place mm. is hugely costly, yeah, but there's more than one way to do it, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think the Tesla's necessarily going to be the, the final solution. It's just, it's the first one to make it available to, to some people. That's pretty much it from me. So what, let's uh, have a look at a scenario um, uh, at specific to Yay or sure. Alexandra. Yep. Um, from about, I mean, Yay has two clocks a year, one for the first half, one for the second half. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it, it, let's we'll just say we get a couple of, uh, and we frequently get these all day fog. Yep. What's it, is it gonna generate anything during the day? Yes, it will because it's not just purely sunlight, but actually the UV bandwidth as well. So it's not just visible light that also produces power, but the whole spectrum of light. So, so, uh, so if you've got a fog yep. um, versus a sunny day, yep. um, oh, oh actually, no, a fog versus a cloudy day, mm -hmm. there will, will there be much difference in generation? They'll be comparable, yeah. So be comparable. what about a uh, fog versus, or cloudy versus a sunny day? It's almost like comparing summer to winter, where summer's going to be two or three times more effective with solar yeah. than it will in winter. Right. And you earlier on, you're talking about those different inverters. Yes. The, um, um, so, under what circumstance would you advise putting on those individual micro inverters? Yeah. Put my Most typical example is if there's a big tree to say the northwest of the property, and that's going to be a sweeping shadow across the array. So as that sun rises and sets, if you've got a standard string inverter, as you approaching that afternoon, if one or two of those panels are shaded, that whole string is effectively taken out. 
versus if you have micro inverters, those first two panels, first four, first six, first eight, but the remainder of the panels still remain producing power later into the afternoon as that show sweeps across. So how much extra do they cost say on the typical house installation? Ten, fifteen percent probably. It's not a lot. No, it's it's not significant, but if you're looking at a you know a seven kilowatt system that's ten thousand dollars, it might be different between ten and twelve. And and <coughs> going back to the um, the non Chinese ones, yeah, are, are the non Chinese ones all of similar quality or or There's are they better? And, and the, there's some good and some bad, I suppose, but um, mostly REC, LG. Well, LG makes it. Yeah, some power. They're probably the three. Well, LG was still fine. It was, but they're, they're, to compete in the market. Yeah, they've had to change they've their They've had to change their manufacturing because yep. they can't compete because of the pricing. But they still offer it. They offer a Chinese panel at, with a 25 year warranty yep. made in China. So it, it's the same technology, but yeah, made in China. Is, is there any um, development in the um, recycling of used solar panels? Yeah, there is. Just a little bit better. It's a, it's a really... There's a new company there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's really challenging to recycle the parts inside a solar panel. Obviously the aluminium frame is really easy to knock off, but the silicon's wafered between silica, which is glass, and obviously you can break that off and melt it, but it's hugely en energy intensive to do so. So they're looking at ways to try and make it better. There's a place in Adelaide that dissembles all of the used solar panels, but you have to ship them to Adelaide in order to do that. So there's a few companies that look promising, like they're going to come on board soon, but at this stage, yeah, there's not a lot um, available, unless the panel is still in working order, and then obviously we, you can repurpose it to charge a small off-grid, harder caravan, etc. Oh, so the gentleman at the back of the <laughs> In my scenarios, um, I'm building a, a farmhouse. It's got power through my property, yep. so I can either get um, a new transformer and drop it down the line. Uh, so four metres down, yep. rough and around, it's 17,000 yep. plus about 5,000 trenching for underground. Yep. Versus, I've sort of got quotes for um, 13 kVA battery. Mm -hmm. Uh, 7,900 watts of solar, solar panels yep. and a 5 kVA inverter, yep. which was 24,000. Yep. So above that same price, um, I guess what I would save in grid power, mm -hmm. I'd have to put that money towards batteries in 10 years' time be about equal. Potentially, and you're paying a daily supply charge for the power that you consume every day. So it's a dollar ten, dollar yeah, twenty every day to have the privilege. Yeah, but that'd still work out about the same cost yep. for batteries in ten years' time. Yep. Did you do a load profile with that um, when you did when you got loads of batteries? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that will only give me even a five or six KV inverter. Yeah. Only give you three thousand watts. Yeah, in backup. Output. Yep. Correct. Yep. yep. And that's not really enough, is it? If you got water pumps or no, no, no. no I, we should take that offline and I'll just sort of have a conversation yeah, and give you a bit of a bit of a steer of yeah. direction. Not, not pushing you away from no, it. Thank you. Just have just to delve be, a bit deeper into that Just being a bit realistic about um, cost and those sort of things. Yeah. Before I answer that, I, I'll, I just want to bring up Chinese, Chinese inverters. Don't be scared of Chinese stuff. Um, depends on what Chinese stuff you get. There is some fantastic Chinese inverters and Chinese panels out there. That stand by their warranties. Uh, a SunGrow inverter is the only inverter that you can pay extra and get a 25 year warranty across the board. So don't 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 just think of China and go, oh they're all cheap, I won't swear, but rubbish. <laughs> um, there are some really good quality Chinese. There's some real crap. I'm telling you now, there are some there's still some crappy and there's some crappy panels out there that that has not changed. But don't think that you can't, if someone offers you a Chinese in, inverter, just check the company out, see that it's been there long term, check the profitability of the company, no different of the panels, and, and you know, you can get some reassurance in there, some really good stuff. Trina is a fantastic Chinese um, manufacturer, it's been about a very, very long time, 
Um, stand by their warranty. I had a case where we did an install in 2013, I think we did, and um, the, the panels had faded on the back and the back sheet started to have an earth bolt. And despite the fact the warranty was very flippant in the fact that back then it wasn't 10 years or anything like that, they supported their product in tear wood panels. So, and it was a very simple process. So don't, I don't want everyone to go China, don't, don't think like that. I think I it's more because I understand the what it is. Side yes. I understand that. Absolutely. I just yeah. <laughs> yeah. I understand that. And I understand there are some yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So can I just ask a bit of a more global question um, in respect to the, the first thing? I, the first time I heard of twenty thirty A, right? Yeah. And so how 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 does all this link in with twenty thirty A? Because 2030A went for the grant to get the guys. Yeah, but maybe John can answer it because I'm. 2030A was formed out by a community consultation process in 2019, where the community was asked what projects they would like to see. Right. There were in the end there were 11 pro 10 or 11 mm -hmm. projects selected, right. and the microgrid was one of them, mm -hmm. and got, so a small committee was formed, and that committee after it said our target is 2030, so we're now called 2030A. Right, so, so is that only for the town, or is well, it for the region? Mm, like the, the, for the town. Well, it's basically for the town, but we're mm. trying to cover 3717. Yeah, well, okay, okay, yeah. so therefore that covers me. Well, I don't. So how do I link into what you're doing, in other words? Become a member. No, but yeah, <laughs> I understand what you're saying here, but I, I still don't know what it means. Me. Well, we're, we're, whether we get a microgrid, yeah. but it's technically it's a that's a real challenge. Yeah, I can and imagine. How it's proportionally expensive yeah. to achieve. Community batteries. Um, we may not get to that, but we our idea is to come re, um, 100 percent renewable by 2030 or uh, carbon neutral at least. So what we would we're promoting solar panels and energy efficiency for right. people in the in the area. Because <coughs> why my question is, is you know, I'm going to do something, sure, right? And if I go and do something, and and I find out in two years' time that, oh, you know, 2030A of doing something which I could have fit into, which would have saved me ten thousand bucks or whatever. Oh, it'll be yeah. something that we can retrofit to a lot of customers. So there's a device manufactured by Mondo called Ubi, and effectively it can communicate if the, the microgrid was to proceed, everyone that's in that locale could partake exactly. in that by fitting a, a third party device that could then use your solar and batteries to communicate. Right. So you understand the question? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what, where I'm yeah, coming yeah. from? Yeah. I'm not negative, I just want to, mm. I want to understand. Oh, but we're new, so we're still trying to get away. I'm newer. <laughs> We'd love to have you as a member. <laughs> uh, that's right. But anything you put in will be of use. Yeah. Yes. We hope so. The, yeah, I, can, yeah I, I understood that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sir. Um, I've just recently got a quote from RAC Solar to put uh, panels and a Tesla wall battery on my property. Sure. And the idea was to get an uh, electric car soon afterwards. Yep. From what I learned tonight, are you suggesting that I should buy the electric car and do without the power wall? No, not necessarily. So it really depends on when and how you're going to charge your car. Yeah. So what the battery on the house, because we don't have bi-directional charging yet, that's something that will happen oh. in the future. Right. And so what bi-directional charging will allow you to do is obviously even if you have the power wall, they're going to work together with yeah. the car. So it's it's long term the bi-directional charging. I don't want to charging. pay for a power wall and then find out that yeah, no, of course. the house anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> batteries at this stage obviously save you more money than if you have without it. Sure. As well as give absolutely. you that, yeah, that grid independence. Yeah. No, I just want to get the case. car component because you're right, the car is a big battery. It is, yeah. yeah. And why would I pay mm, yeah, fifteen thousand dollars for power sure. wall when I can buy the car now and yeah. take it off the purchase price of the car? Absolutely. I guess what the battery allows you to do is capture some of that excess power produced during the day and then you can charge the car yeah, with what's remaining yeah. at night when you don't have so you're not paying for that component of power that you would have otherwise paid for. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. How far away is that possibility? Bidirectional charging? 
I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got no idea. It's really, um, it's something that's going to take years. Does it take the car manufacturers to do it or something else? Manufacturers can do it tomorrow. That's it's the got to be legislated. Part. Yeah, correct. It's got to be comfortable and legislated. It's, it's a government decision as much as it is anything. Yeah. So that's the balance, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Hyundai are bringing out a car sometime in the next 12 months which will have a GPO in it. Yeah, a PowerPoint. Yeah. Yep. In, so you'll be able to hook up any of your appliances. appliances to yeah. I'll take your washing <laughs> machine with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Camping. So I mean, the, I mean, like the advantage is if there is a power outage, you, you can, can plug your phone in, plug your laptop in. Yeah, absolutely. Plug, plug your fridge in. Seems like a pretty easy thing to I put in. Be legislated. You can just the control <laughs> going in and out. It's not that much power, darling. Sorry, you. When I looked up battery focus, right, there's something like, I don't know, 30 batteries. <laughs> so a lot of, of all these different types of chemistry. Sure. Right. So you've only talked about one tonight. Lithium. Yep. Um, is there anything else? Not com uh, not commercially available or cost not, effective. Not, not, no, I wouldn't recommend anything else at this stage, no. Just, um, I did go to a, a farmer to buy something. <coughs> and, um, he, he set up a system, right? Lead acid? Up, which I hadn't heard of. Lead acid? Um, bromine? Yes, salt bromine. Yep. Yeah, it was a, yeah, well, it's, put, no, I don't think it's lead acid. Yeah. He converted it from lead acid to something yep. else. Anyway, um, so he made, me, he made me think then, when, when, when I looked it all up, there's you know, all these different ones and all got positive and negative, and sure. one, one of them, commercial, I think, availability, yep. cost, and cost and all the rest of it. But some of them were quite good in respect to um, they uh, yeah, had a much longer life, for example. Yeah, yeah. The cycle rate. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I don't think lithium's the answer. It's just the best available in the market yeah, the now. Market. Okay. It's going to change. Like yeah. It won't be forever. It's not going to be the best battery. It's just the most readily available for us to produce in a cost-effective way today. But are the prices, prices of batteries, because when I was on council, we did a um, Hindi followed by by Sam. Yep. And they totally recommended not most people not getting the batteries because they didn't think it was cost effective yet yep. to yep. actually do it. Absolutely. It it depends what your motivation for battery storage are. Some people want energy independence, they want to save more money. A battery will provide you to do that. It is a long term investment. Like there's no lying about that, but provided you're intending to be in your house long term you will save more money with a battery. It's it's pretty simple. And and there are other ways to use that excess solar like there, there's ways of if, if you look at heat pumps and these sort of things you can certainly get control that way you can start pushing turning on different things there, there, there are, there's other technologies out there that will allow you other than a battery and hot water is a perfect example of something that yeah. costs us enormous amount of money and if you're able if you've got a, a heat pump that's able to switch within your solar and as soon as you get to excess it starts to run it's a way of reducing. It's like having a, a battery without having a battery, I guess. Yep. And can't you get a little device that enables you to do that? Yep, pretty much. Just yep. a, a more or less a, a smart timer in your switchboard. Yeah. Um, when we moved into our house, it had a, an almost brand new electric hot water oh, service, yep. which we got our electrician to make heat during the day. Sure. It heats on our solar. So yep. it's, it's kind of a battery for us. Absolutely, yeah. it is. Yep. Just a, a rudimentary timer, yeah, it might be a couple hundred dollars, which is fairly easy to retrofit. The challenge if you don't have a large solar system and you do that in winter, if you have four days, you're obviously going to pay more to heat your hot water than if you don't, hence why. And then you push a button to the chair. Yeah. Perfect, <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> so can that be done? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, without a doubt. So the electrician should know about that. It's, it's literally just a simple relay with a timer, and you can set the time that you want it to come on and off. Just, and just be, but be careful of your element sizes and these sort of things yep. because it depends on, yeah, it, there's a lot of electrics that come with it, but if you've got a 4.8 element in a, in a hot water, your solar's going to struggle to, to heat it. Yep. Um, it'll m make it lukewarm, but it's going to struggle. It depends on your element size, whether you can reduce it, your temperature, whether you can turn your temperature down, depending on what you're doing. Um, a basic way of saving money on electricity is to turn your, temp your thermostat down to 60 degrees. Like we've all got it at 75, but you turn it down to 6 degrees, you still can't put your hand on it, you'll save yourself some money. So it's, there's simple things you can do that can also save you money. There's a product called Kest Power. Yes, yeah. absolutely. They're all very just, just can't use that on dual phase. 
Um, yep. Sites. On multi-phase properties, it hasn't challenged. Properties. Uh, I've got it on mine. Okay. I've, I'm going to store that line. I've got two phases. Yep. I've yep. got it on one phase. Yep. The, the struggle you have is you, you can only have it on one phase because it has to be connected. The blue version has to be connected to yeah. the internet on the same phase. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, there's there's some there's some other products out there other than Catch Bear that will yeah, do the same, the thing. same thing. That that has its purpose, but it is has got its limitations also. Oh yes. Yeah. As everything does. Yeah. What's the maintenance on my lithium? They're allowed out there as well. Do you have to top up the... The lithium-ion batteries are completely sealed. No, lithium, no more. lithium ion batteries are maintenance-free. You don't They've have still to. got acid in that one. No, they don't. Yeah. In terms of um, hot water, yeah. if you've got a heat pump, you can always time when you're going Absolutely to Absolutely, you can, yes. You can run it during the day. It could be an option. You just have to weigh up how old your current hot water system is and whether it's worth the investment of a new mm. new hot water service. You said a bloke to me a few minutes ago trying to sell me, um, give, give me a free hot water yep. yeah. pump. <laughs> but it, when I looked it up, it doesn't have that capacity. You can't, you can't choose when it, no, when it's it just, charges. Correct, yeah. There's there's good and bad heat pumps out there anyway. Yes. Generally with the government scheme, if you can get it for nothing, it might work for a couple of years and it's worth taking a gamble on perhaps, but long term I, I wouldn't be confident in the product if you're paying nothing for it. Oh, so the government's not selling. Sorry. I was just going to say, so the government's selling. No, the government's not selling hot waters. There's just a rebate available for thousand dollars. Sorry, one of the other rebates that's currently available is solar hot water rebate, which is relevant to a heat pump, which is a thousand dollars. But you get that for the solar or the battery. You can't get. You can't double dip on any of those. What? If you've got a moderate size house, yep. I want to. I haven't got solar. Sure. And I want a good, um, a good brand, mm -hmm. um, and uh, reasonable installers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how much is it, roughly the ballpark? Uh, how much is the difference between the two? Hot water or the hot water? The, what, the what, how much? Do you know how many kilowatts you use? Because that that comes down to the size. Do you know how much kilowatts you use per day? Would you roughly know? Uh, no. Across about eight hundred bucks a quarter. Yeah. So there's a lot of electricity. There's the tricky thing about solar, there's no like perfect size for anyone. It really depends what you're trying to achieve. If you say you want to get rid of the bills, obviously you're going to put a big system on. If you're just happy to find a happy meeting between saving 60 or 70 percent, it might be a six or eight kilowatt system. The price is going to vary pretty vastly between retailers, but a good rule of thumb is somewhere around a dollar per watt, roughly, after the rebate. So an eight kilowatt system, eight thousand dollars after the rebate is probably a good balance between top end products and bottom of the barrel. That probably sits somewhere right in the middle, just as a bit of a guide. So, so for something like that, how long before you can pay? How many years before you pay? Off? Most residential solar systems will pay themselves off between four and eight years. And when I give that vast range, is purely based on how much you can consume during the day. Yes. If you can shift eighty percent of your habits to during the daytime, it's obviously going to be much shorter payback and that's a, that's what I mean by there's no perfect size of solar if you have a three kilowatt system based on your bills the impact might only be 10 or 15 percent but you're going to recoup those costs in three or four years versus a much larger system say a 10 kilowatt system that is going to cost you a lot more up front but it's going to take maybe six or seven years to pay itself back but the impact on the bill is going to be significantly more so the the size is really going to be um on your roof. Absolutely, so, that's obviously the limiting factor in a lot of cases, how many we can physically fit, is there shading from any trees or anywhere we can't go because of the skylight, it's all hot water. If but, you've got a paddock, we can do a ground out. But, um, <laughs> you can, but um, that's why all of these things we're talking about are ballparks and where you really have to get a tailored like personalised quote that's specific to you because there's so many things that can vary. So, so 10 years ago, you, you would put solar on your house you put as much as you could because you're going to get 66 cents. That, that's that's what you did. You just loaded it up as much as you possibly could fit, fit anywhere you could put a panel to make it make it viable. And it was all about money. It wasn't about energy or anything now. Now it's about every one of you tailing your own solar system. Forget about what neighbours done. What's going to suit you and your lifestyle. Some, want, some people have use a lot of power in the 
the morning. So you'll need an east. You want more east and you want west. Some are home in the afternoons and they don't do nothing oh, in the morning. Why you, do the you go yes. west. You know, it's not all about true north. It's not all, it's about what's best for you. And that's that's what everyone needs to take away from this. It's it's not it's not a goes across everyone like we used to do. It's just it's got to be tailored to your house, whether you whether you, what you want to achieve, what you don't want to achieve, all those things. So it's it's a real important. It's a twenty five year investment, and that's how you need to look at it. And that's why you need a company that's going to stand by you through that time, monitor, look at things, and those sort of things. So. Just for reference, this is an all north facing array. So you can see in the afternoon around dinner time, they're obviously using more power. In summer, it'd be ideal to have some west facing panels so that you can increase that curve towards that evening so you can consume more power. In this case, it wasn't possible, they're full of trees. So it was all north facing. Yeah, but you can move that gray area down to that high. Absolutely, yep. So the orientation will impact this curve. So it's just, that's just all north in January. So what's the battery cost? Yeah. Good question. Um, probably two dollars fifty in Melbourne. Yeah, <laughs> double A, triple A. Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's too broad a question I think to answer. Yeah, maybe twelve hundred dollars a kilowatt hour if I'm just going to pick a number out of the air to give you some kind of idea. Yeah. Where is technology moving so fast? Yep. In changing so quickly, we see you know you've got to have the latest and the greatest. How adaptable are manufacturers making? I know Elon Musk has gone out on his own and he's sure. done his own thing and he said, well, you can only use my, um, my charger if you've got the Tesla and yes. you use that now. But at some stage, the battle's got to settle down yes. and they will start producing a particular battery because that's the optimum kind of battery they have. Yep. How, how adaptable is it going to be for those people who buy their electric? I mean, are they considering the fact that, you know, things become antediluvian nowadays so mm. quickly yeah. that it, you, you know, you, you're frightened to put your foot in the water because sure. it's going to get bitten off by another shark who comes along. Yeah. Later, you know. It's funny that you use Tesla as an example because Tesla Powerwall can be retrofitted to any solar system. Yeah. It doesn't matter what brand you have because of the nature of AC coupling, which means it's not directly communicating, but it's got some communication between what's coming in and out of the property in terms of power, it can talk to anything. So there is that redundancy, I suppose. Yeah. I, I suppose when I was thinking of Tesla, I was thinking more about cars. The cars, yeah. 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 I guess that's what people are gonna buy. That's really what's gonna drive the market and Tesla's really good at marketing, so that's what people are buying at the moment. But you, but you don't have to put a battery on there. No. You can you put a battery ready system, put a hybrid inverter. Um, don't, Spend a bit more money and don't just get a normal inverter. Get a hybrid inverter. So when 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 you, things settle or when you're comfortable or when you want to dip your toe in, you can you can go down that path and you can advance and move with the technology. It's it doesn't these decisions don't have to be made in five minutes. So you can have a long term plan of where you want to be in the next ten years and, and a part of it. Solar panels have advanced so so much. I would not be scared to put any solar panel in anything. You know, the, the technology is just miles and the price above. Is oh, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to know. That's the thing. You've got to know what's available so you can plan ahead. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. how do you get that information? Engage with a reputable retailer that yeah. can walk you through the, the process. Yeah, you invite them out to your farm. And yeah. You don't, you don't. You, and I don't want to turn, turn this into the sales thing, so <laughs> understand that I'm not a salesman. I'm an yeah. electrician, so um, you have someone that wants to invest in the journey with you that's going to be around when you're ready. Not someone who wants to just go, yep, I want to sell you a Tesla Powerwall, I want to sell you a 6.6 because it's easy for me. Because that's what they do. People that walk around and sell 6.6 .6 kilowatt systems and Tesla Powerwalls and don't want to listen to the story and don't want to adjust, they're there just for the sale. They won't be around for your journey, I guarantee you. You want someone to come out and see you and individualise what you're trying to do and be personable. And that's what you need. So it doesn't matter whether it's us, I don't, but 
whatever it is that needs so to be sorted wants to be best to be judged. That's why we brought in the Dindy by file, Dindy bulk by stamp. Yep. Um, was to actually take a lot of that guesswork yeah, the out noise so and all the noise out. But yep. what was really interesting was that how many of how many um, the charlatans in the sort oh, of yeah. industry were actually coming up at the same time that we were actually implementing it. Yep. Yeah, without a doubt. But it took a lot of the guesswork out for a yep. lot, you know, like the the, the issue. But then the Victorian government brought in their new <laughs> rebates yeah, and it was like, a, yeah, start again. Yeah. Some years ago. Converters look at a life expectancy of like five to seven years. Yep. Is that still the case or are they... We would expect 15 to 20 years out of most inverters, obviously. SunGrow is one of the brands that will warrant their inverters for 25. The one that comes out of Austria. Uh, Fr Fronius. Fronius. Yep. Yeah. Yep. They, have, they come with a 10 year warranty, but again, you can pay to extend that warranty to 15 or 20 years if you would like to. So they're confident the product will last you just paying for the warranty period, basically. I refer to it like a warranty on a car. After three years, the wheels don't fall off. It keeps on producing. Yeah. Mm. Awesome.